Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're starting our fourth class of our retreat series, Harmony and Relationships. This is where I've been sharing eight unique classes in order to help you understand the teachings that I shared in a retreat this past summer in America. So I'd like to welcome all of you guys to today's class. The topic of today's class is training the mind to acquire concentration, developing singleness of mind in a distracting world. If you've been studying the Buddhist teachings, then you're probably aware that his core central teaching is the Eightfold Path. This is eight individual steps that is the path to enlightenment. This is your life practice in order to gradually train the mind to eliminate discontent feelings, moving the mind to enlightenment, where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. There's no longer any discontent feelings in an enlightened mind. So all anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, even the slightest amount of displeasure or unsatisfactoriness is completely eliminated from the enlightened mind. In addition to these qualities of mind and the enlightened mind, you also will experience focus, concentration, deep memory, and clarity of mind. An enlightened being can be very focused and concentrated as part of their practice because the mind has been trained to develop concentration. This is why concentration is one of the eight steps on the Eightfold Path. This core central teaching that the Buddha shared, which is the path to enlightenment, the eighth step is called right concentration. This is where you train the mind to have focus and concentration because with a concentrated mind, you're able to then bring forth your wisdom to make wise decisions in daily life. If you didn't have concentration, if you had what the Buddha called a muddled mind, it would be very difficult for you to do things like practice right intention or right speech or right action, where you're not causing harm through your intentions, your speech, and your action. So as you learn these teachings and you're training the mind to be stable and steady and unshakable in this enlightened mental state where it's peaceful and joyful, you're also cultivating concentration so that the mind can be focused and clear and concentrated. There's various aspects of the Eightfold Path that are going to guide you to accomplishing all the aspects of the enlightened mind and eliminate discontentedness. And as you put together more and more of those steps of the Eightfold Path, you will develop more and more right concentration. But there's very specific things that you can do in order to develop right concentration. Some of those things are breathing mindfulness meditation, which we'll be talking about today in today's class, and practicing generosity. Because when you're practicing breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, you're training the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. This mental longing and strong eagerness, where the mind's chasing after the objects of its affection. If the unenlightened mind is chasing after the objects of its affection with craving, desire, attachment, if you get what you want, you're going to get pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. These are pleasant feelings and the mind acquires those based on some condition. So if the mind is chasing with craving, desire, attachment, and it gets the object of its affection, this mental longing and strong eagerness, this yearning is fulfilled, then it's going to experience those pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, and euphoria. But when the mind doesn't get what it wants, 
or what it expects, it will experience painful feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, things like this. And this is problematic to the mind. So the breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity and other aspects of this path to enlightenment, you're training your mind to move closer and closer to this enlightened mental state. And as you put together all the various steps of the Eightfold Path, you'll experience more and more concentration in the mind because you're eliminating craving, desire, attachment. That's the cause that is creating the pleasant feelings to arise, but they're only temporary, so they're dissatisfying. That's also what's causing the painful feelings to arise. And once again, those are dissatisfying too, because who is interested in being angry and frustrated or irritable or all these other discontent feelings that one might experience? So as you're putting together the steps of right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, this is where the mind starts experiencing what we call the jhanas. The jhanas are four preliminary phases that the mind experiences as it moves into the first stage of enlightenment. There's four individual stages of enlightenment. It's not until the fourth stage that the mind is actually enlightened. We call this an arahant or an enlightened being. When you move into that first stage of enlightenment, from there, you'll notice significant diminishing of discontentedness in the mind. And then there's further progress that you need to make in order to actually get to the enlightened mind. But as you're putting together these steps of the Eightfold Path and moving the mind closer and closer to enlightenment, you'll experience these jhanas. This is what the Buddha actually describes in the Eightfold Path as part of right concentration. He explains the results of putting together all the other steps on the Eightfold Path. And that's what is called the jhanas. He explains these four jhanas and the mental qualities that you'll experience as the mind's moving through these various phases. This is why the Buddhist teachings are not to be believed, but instead you can actually independently verify his teachings. Because as you're learning them, as you're reflecting on his teachings and independently verifying them, and you're practicing them to train the mind, you can see for yourself that there's less discontentedness and then there's more concentration. There's more focus, there's more clarity, there's more memory. The mind is starting to function more optimally. This is why the Buddha explained that if the string of an instrument is too tight and you pluck it, it doesn't play beautiful music. And if the string's too loose and you pluck it, it doesn't play beautiful music. The instrument's not playing the way that it was intended to play. And the human mind is exactly the same way, that if you're holding on to things too tight and you're chasing after the objects of your affection, the mind isn't functioning the way it was intended to function. But also, if you were indifferent, if the mind was dull and lethargic and unmotivated, the mind isn't functioning well here either. So what this eightfold path is doing, among other things, is it's training the mind to come into the middle where now, just like a musical instrument, if you tune the string perfectly in the middle and you pluck that string, it plays beautiful music like the instrument was intended to play. The human mind is the same way when you bring it to the middle, it will function in the way that it was intended to function. And now your personal and professional relationships can blossom. When you have concentration and you have focus, you have clarity of mind, and you're practicing all the other teachings as part of the Eightfold Path, in the mind's gaining this memorization and being able to memorize things and have deep memory, you can function very well in life through your personal and professional relationships. You can develop harmony in your relationships when you have a concentrated mind, for example. But when your mind is muddled and it's struggling and it's having all these difficulties in life, it's very challenging to have concentration. It's very challenging to essentially function in personal and professional relationships in a way that's going to be conducive to allowing you to develop harmony in your relationships. So by you training your mind more readily to develop this concentration, the mind is going to be performing more optimally. You're going to observe that in your personal and professional relationships, you can bring forth your wisdom, and now you can develop more and more harmony in your relationships. 
Whereas if you allow the mind to continue to be muddled as the Buddha talks, then it's going to be problematic as you struggle and have difficulties in the world. So this concentration in the Eightfold Path, the Buddha explains the results of that, but then in other places in his teachings, he explains essentially what right concentration is and how to develop clear comprehension and have clarity of mind. So the things that I'm going to share with you today in our class is guidance to help you understand how to cultivate this clarity of mind and this concentration so that this mind can be brought to the middle and the mind can perform optimally and then your personal and professional relationships will blossom. As we go in today's class, you're welcome to ask questions. If you're in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can put those into the comment section and our moderators will see that and be sure your questions get asked during the class. If you're in Zoom, there's a way to electronically raise your hand and you can ask any questions or follow-up questions directly live through Zoom if you'd like. So once again, I'd like to welcome all of you guys to our class. So the first thing that I would like to share with you is in terms of developing this concentration and developing singleness of mind in this distracting world, the number one thing to always keep in mind is that it's important to continue to acquire wisdom. It's wisdom that is going to lead to the improvement to the condition of your mind. And the way that you acquire wisdom is that you don't believe the Buddhist teachings. There's no belief in the Buddhist teachings. He never once said, just believe me. His teachings are very different than other traditions that you might have practiced or you might have been exposed to, where sometimes we're taught to believe, 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 and when we die, something good's going to happen for us. But in that situation, you don't necessarily know what you're believing is true or false or right or wrong because it's just a belief. And because someone is just believing, there's the ability for an individual to be misled. There's the ability for the mind to be believing a false truth. But when you learn teachings like what the Buddha shares and you don't believe them, you just learn them. And then you start reflecting on them, trying to independently verify whether they're true or false. Then as you're independently verifying them to be true, then you can actually practice his teachings and start training the mind. And as you train the mind in daily life through meditation and other aspects of the Eightfold Path, then you gradually see that the mind is improving. Where the mind once got angry or sad or frustrated or you had loneliness or boredom, you'll see that gradually that will diminish and the mind will no longer be experiencing those discontent feelings or others. And this is where you can independently observe for yourself that the teachings are the truth and they're leading to an improved condition of mind and they're leading to an improved condition of life. Because you know what it felt like to be angry and sad and bored and lonely and these other discontent feelings. And now as your mind continues to improve through training, you can see that those feelings are gradually diminishing through the training that you're doing. So it's very important that with all the teachings of the Buddha that you don't believe what I say, that you don't believe what I talk about in classes, that you don't believe what I teach in retreats, that you don't believe any of the books that I write and things that I share with you, but instead you learn what I share, you reflect on it and independently verify it, examine it, investigate it, and then you practice what's being shared so you can see the truth for yourself. And in this way, you can never be misled because as you're learning what I'm sharing with you, as you see the condition of the mind improving, you know that it's 100% the truth. So continuing to learn and focus on your own development, specifically with the Eightfold Path, because it's the Eightfold Path that putting all those pieces together that's going to ultimately lead to more improved concentration. This next one that I'm going to share with you is about meditation and generosity. But as it relates to acquiring wisdom in the Eightfold Path, if you just meditated and that's all you did, you wouldn't experience enlightenment. Because if you actually just meditate, 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 but you go out into the world and you are harsh and aggressive and hostile or bitter with people, you're not going to be able to experience a peaceful and joyful life. Because the more hostile and bitter that you are, the more of that that's going to come back to you. 
So one of the biggest myths in the Buddhist communities is typically that the Buddha sat under a tree, he meditated, and instantly got to enlightenment. But if you read his original teachings, he actually doesn't say this. He says just the opposite. He says that it wasn't instantaneous that he got to enlightenment. It was through gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. And you've seen that to be true with everything that you've ever learned in life, whether it's the English language, whether it was some other skill or ability that you now have, you had to gradually learn you gradually practice that and you gradually experience progress to get better and better, more proficient at that. And the path to enlightenment is exactly the same way because what the path to enlightenment is, is understanding these natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught. Just like with gravity, where as a child we struggled with that and we didn't have the wisdom of the natural law and we kept falling down and having difficulties because our lack of wisdom of this natural law of gravity. As we gained more wisdom over the course of our life, we started being able to make wiser decisions and we experienced better results with this natural law of gravity. So there's these other natural laws that the Buddha explained and that he taught that the unenlightened mind is just unaware of. It doesn't understand. So that's why the unenlightened mind struggles and has difficulties in the world because it hasn't been trained. It doesn't have wisdom. It's lacked the wisdom of the these natural laws and because it lacks the wisdom it's going to struggle and have difficulties just like we did when we were six years old with the natural law of gravity we awakened to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity and then we made wiser choices that created more wholesome outcomes we tied our shoes we looked at the street when we walked we put special things in a certain place so they wouldn't break so as we awoke to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity we made wiser choices that produced more wholesome outcomes. And the same thing is transpiring with all these other natural laws that the Buddha taught is that we need to learn them. Don't believe. You never believe that the natural law of gravity existed. You saw the truth for yourself that it exists. So that's what you learn, you reflect, and you practice. You improve your decision making and training your mind through acquiring wisdom. This is what's going to lead to awakening of the mind. This word awakening or enlightenment, it's kind of like, well, what is that? Well, what it really truly is, is awakening the mind to the wisdom or gaining the insight and wisdom of these natural laws so that then you'll make wiser and wiser choices in the world about how you interact in the world. That's essentially what awakening is, is you're acquiring wisdom. So be sure that with this topic that I'm talking about today and all the other topics that you ever learn related to the Buddhist teachings, that you always focus on acquiring wisdom because that's what's going to actually lead to your awakening as you gain more and more insight and knowledge and wisdom about his teachings through not believing them, but learning, reflecting, and practicing to see the truth for yourself. In order to acquire concentration in this distracting world and to develop harmony in your relationships, you're going to need to develop a meditation practice. The two primary forms of meditation that the Buddha taught are breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. There are some other forms that he taught too, but these two are the only primary forms that everybody would actually need in order to awaken to enlightenment is breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness these two meditations are what i teach as part of this program because they address two of the major problems that are in the unenlightened mind there's three high level problems and then there's 10 individual detail problems that the Buddha discovered. So breathing mindfulness meditation is addressing the craving, desire, attachment, that mental longing and strong eagerness that produces discontent feelings. So all sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, jealousy, resentment, displeasure, grief, all of these discontent feelings and others are being caused by the same exact thing, craving, desire, attachment. This is why you don't need to run out and learn 100 different meditations or even 50 or even 20 different meditations. You only need to know two primary forms because 
there isn't a meditation for stress. There isn't a meditation for anxiety or for displeasure or grief or shyness or loneliness or boredom. All the individual discontent feelings are actually being caused by the exact same thing, which is craving, desire, attachment. So breathing mindfulness meditation is helping you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. It's also helping you to arise and cultivate in the mind mindfulness or awareness of mind, and it's helping you to develop concentration. The way that this happens is with breathing mindfulness meditation, you're focused on the breath. You've got your eyes closed, you're breathing in slowly and naturally in and out of the nose, and you're focusing the mind on the breath. And as you're focusing the mind on the breath, that breath is the single object that you're focusing on. This is where you're developing singleness of mind by focusing on just a single object like the breath and training the mind to be peaceful and content and joyful in that situation where it's only doing one thing at a time, focusing on the breath. Then with mindfulness or awareness of mind, when the mind moves off the breath, you become aware of that sooner and sooner as the mind moves off the breath. And then you cut off and let go of that thought and bring the mind back to the breath. Essentially what you're doing is you're gaining control or discipline over the mind. You're not trying to actually eliminate the thoughts in meditation because this is impossible. As long as you're alive, you're gonna have thoughts. You have longer and longer gaps of time where the mind's peaceful and content and joyful in meditation. But even as an enlightened being, there's gonna be the occasional thought that comes into the mind when you're actually meditating. So in the breathing mindfulness meditation, you're arising this awareness of mind. You're cultivating mindfulness, being aware that the mind's on the breath or it's off the breath. And then you're developing this concentration or this singleness of mind. And you're getting rid of this craving, desire, attachment where you're gaining control to be able to pull the mind back. Because now in daily life, when you're out and about and you see that anger is about to arise because now you have more mindfulness and you see that anger is about to arise, you can then cut that off and let it go, controlling the mind and bringing it back. But if you don't exercise the mind in meditation through breathing mindfulness meditation and train it to have this ability to have mindfulness concentration and cut off craving, desire, attachment, then you won't be able to do that in daily life. It's just like a professional athlete. They go to the gym and they train in all different kinds of aspects of training, weight training, cardiovascular training, agility training, and all these other different types of training so that then when they go do their sport, they can do it really, really well. Well, the same thing is when you're in meditation, you're training the mind, you're exercising the mind so that then in daily life, when you see something like anger or sadness or frustration or something else arising, you can cut that off and let it go. But if you haven't trained the mind this way, then you're not able to do that very readily. And as you get better and better with your training, you'll actually be able to do that to the point where you will have eliminated all craving, desire, attachment, and then the mind will no longer get angry. It will no longer experience sadness. It will no longer experience irritation or guilt or shame or fear or any of these other discontent feelings because you've purified the mind. You've eliminated the conditions that are causing the mind to be shaken up. You've eliminated the conditions that are causing it to experience discontentedness. So that's why it can be permanently peaceful and joyful for the rest of this life. Well, as you're doing this with breathing mindfulness meditation, training the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, you would also be interested in practicing generosity because the giving and sharing of time, effort, energy, and resources is also helping you to train the mind to let go and practice elimination of craving, desire, attachment. Because a mind that has craving, desire, attachment is going to be pretty selfish. It's going to hold on to things kind of tightly. And as you practice generosity, giving and sharing more than is strictly required of your time, effort, energy, and resources, then your mind is trained to let go. 
So this is why we practice generosity. So breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity is working together in order to help train the mind to eliminate that underlying cause and condition of craving, desire, attachment that's causing the mind to be discontent. And the more that you eliminate craving, desire, attachment, this is what's actually producing the concentration. Oftentimes people think that the meditation is what's producing the concentration. Well, in a way, yes, it is. But actually, in true reality, what's truly occurring is that you're eliminating the craving, desire, attachments. You're eliminating the mind's longing and yearning, chasing after the objects of its affection. As long as that pollution is in the mind, the mind's going to be muddled and it's going to be shaken up. So with breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, training the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, as those are being eliminated from the mind, the mind then becomes more and more concentrated, more focused. You're getting more clarity. You're getting deeper memory. Because as long as you're carrying around craving where you're chasing after the objects of your affection, this is like a burden. It's like carrying around this burden on your shoulders because the mind is just chasing that new pair of shoes, or it's chasing and wanting a new house, or it's wanting a new car, wanting a new job, wanting more money at your job, wanting more friends, wanting this, wanting that. As long as the mind is chasing after the objects of its affection, it's like carrying around this weight on your shoulders or a burden. And as long as the mind is doing that, it's going to have to work really, really hard The mind's going to be struggling. It's going to have difficulties. You're going to feel completely exhausted at the end of your day because the mind has been chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing. So by practicing breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, you are essentially training the mind to let go and no longer hold on to things. You're training the mind to be comfortable with impermanence and that things are constantly changing. And as long as the mind's holding on, wanting things to be permanent, then it can experience permanent joy. It can experience permanent peacefulness because it hasn't trained itself to understand impermanence, where all these things in the world are impermanent. Our clothes are impermanent, our relationships are impermanent, Our jobs are impermanent. Our incomes are impermanent. Everything that we experience in this life, it's all impermanent. But yet the unenlightened mind craves for these things to be permanent and it's holding on to them very tightly. So the meditation and generosity is training the mind to let these things go and training the mind to come into the middle. Now, without craving desire attachment, the mind can be focused and concentrated. This concentration is going to be produced when you're eliminating craving, desire, attachment. But there's these other two problems in the mind that the Buddha described at a high level, which is the anger and the ignorance or unknowing of true reality. When you're fully eliminating these three pollutions, that's what's ultimately going to bring the mind concentration. So craving, desire, attachment is a significant problem in the mind. That's where the mind is longing and yearning, wanting the objects of your affection. If you get what you want, you get these pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, and others. If you don't get what you want, then the mind gets angered, frustrated, irritated. And that's where unskillful conduct like bitterness and hostility and animosity come out through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. And the whole reason why these two things exist is because of ignorance, the unknowing of true reality. That's where you antidote that with wisdom, training the mind to not believe these teachings, but learning them, reflecting on them to independently verify them, and then practicing them to see the truth for yourself. And this is where the mind becomes very wise. And now with this wisdom, you understand what's truly happening in the mind. And now you can implement the training to eliminate craving. And as you eliminate craving, you eliminate anger. And all of this is occurring because you're eliminating ignorance by arising wisdom. You're acquiring wisdom by attending these classes. You're acquiring wisdom by reading the books and understanding the words of the Buddha. You're acquiring wisdom by having personal discussions with your teacher. You're acquiring wisdom by learning in these classes and then putting it into 
practice in your daily life and seeing the truth for yourself. So the more you arise this wisdom about these teachings, then you can actually apply the teachings in your daily life to eradicate craving and anger. And as you're eradicating craving, anger, and ignorance, these pollutions of mind are being removed from the mind. Now the mind becomes more purified, and that's where the concentration comes into the mind. And you start focusing and practicing singleness of mind. In your daily life, you might have been taught that it's helpful to multitask. Well, if you've been taught to multitask, which is essentially an unknowing of true reality. This is ignorance that we've been taught and that we might have adopted at different times in our life where we think that we can talk on the phone, we can watch TV and we can eat, for example, or we can be working on the computer, watching a video and talking to our friend or doing multiple things like this. What you come to understand as part of these teachings is that it's important to practice singleness of mind because the mind can actually only do one thing at a time. A person who thinks that they're multitasking, what they're actually doing is you're doing one thing for a few seconds and then you're cycling to something else for a few seconds and then you're cycling to something else for a few seconds. The mind is rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. So if I'm on the phone, I'm watching TV and I'm eating a sandwich, I might be talking for a few seconds on the phone or paying attention on the phone for a few seconds then I'm watching TV for a few seconds, then I'm eating the sandwich for a few seconds. But when all of this is over, you feel like, gosh, I didn't even really remember what I talked about with my friend. Now I've damaged your relationship. I probably need to go clean that up. I didn't really take in the content of the TV and I didn't really digest the sandwich either. That's why I've got a stomach ache now, right? So when the mind is trying to do three things at one time, which is impossible, what it's actually being done is it's actually being trained to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And you do this for enough months and enough years, eventually you get to the point where it's utterly impossible to concentrate. You might find that if you've been trying to multitask and your mind has been rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing, you might find that it's difficult to sit down and read a book. You might find that it's difficult to sit down and have a conversation. Your mind is wandering. You might find that it's difficult to just sit and eat, that you might need to have music on or a video on. You can't just sit and eat. That it's very difficult for the mind and it really struggles to just do one thing at a time because it's been so used to rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. So even just listening to me speak right now, whether you're in this live class, or you're listening to this in a replay, you're training your mind to practice singleness of mind. So if you're listening to me, it's important to just listen and learn. And if you observe that another thought comes up in the mind where you're thinking about what you're going to do when you're done with class, or you're thinking about something you did yesterday, what you would like to do is cut that off and let it go. And if you train your mind in breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity to be able to do that, when you're talking with somebody or you're listening in a learning event like this, then you can take in the content and you can really deeply benefit from it because your mind isn't bouncing around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. Oftentimes people think that they're being more productive when they're multitasking because they've been taught that they can move their mind from thing to thing to thing to thing. A computer can actually do this. With computer technology, it can do multiple things at one time. And this is kind of when multitasking came into play is that when computers came about, people thought that human beings could be the same as a computer. But a human being can't do the same thing as a computer. And the more that you try to function like a computer, the more that the mind will struggle. And if you've been training your mind to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, then you might find that it's a real struggle to stay focused on any one particular thing because the mind's rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing. And it's not content just being in the present moment. So what you would like to do is train the mind to just do one thing at a time, practicing singleness of mind. Some of the words that the Buddha taught is he would say, if you're eating, you're eating. If you're talking, you're talking. If you're walking, you're walking. 
right? These kind of things. So we can say, if you're watching TV, just watch TV. If you're talking on the phone, just talk on the phone, right? If you're eating, just eat, right? Just do one thing at a time. The mind's gonna probably not like this at first when you start training your mind to practice singleness of mind. Moving those benefits from meditation of focusing on just the breath into your daily life where you're doing just one thing at a time. If your mind's been rapidly cycling and that's what you've been doing with it, it might not like to just talk on the phone or it might not like to just sit there and eat by yourself and just focus on eating. It might want to do something else, but this is the craving, desire, attachment. This is the mental longing and strong eagerness. You can't always be rapidly cycling like that because essentially your mind's gonna get diluted and it's gonna degrade the quality of the mind where it's gonna go down and down and down and down and down. So if you would like to bring your mind up to this enlightened mental state, where the mind can be focused and concentrated on just one thing at a time, then do just one thing at a time. Practice singleness of mind. And wherever you observe that your mind is doing something else, cut that off and let it go. Because even though you're learning what I'm sharing with you today, you're not gonna be able to instantly practice it. You'll need to make repeated attempts at doing this. So if you're talking on the phone or if you're in a business meeting or you're watching TV or something like this and you observe that your mind is wandering to something else, where you observe that with mindfulness, cut that off and bring the mind back, right? Don't allow the mind to do multiple things or attempt to do multiple things because it's not possible for it to do multiple things. If you're chatting with a friend online through a chat messaging app and you have this urge or this craving to watch a YouTube video or have that running in the background while you're chatting, get in the habit of pausing that YouTube video, chat with your friend, and then when you're done, go back to the YouTube video rather than allow the mind to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. This is going to help improve the quality of your mind because it's going to get better and better at having focused and clarity and concentration and being able to do just one thing at a time. While it may struggle and it may feel difficult at first to do this, it will get more and more content and more joyful at doing just one thing at a time. As you see more and more concentration coming up in the mind and you see the benefits of having concentration, you will actually like it a lot better and you will choose to do that more and more frequently. But initially, the mind might really struggle with this. Some of the benefits that you're gonna see is that if you truly were on the phone, you were watching TV and you were eating a sandwich, that phone conversation that would otherwise be maybe five or 10 minutes, maybe because of this, now that conversation's 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour long, taking you an absorbent amount of time to have this conversation. So it's actually taking you more time. The mind falsely believes that it's more productive to do three things at one time or attempt to do three things at one time, but it's actually not possible. So the conversation is elongated because the mind is rapidly cycling and it's not focused and concentrated on just the conversation. And now not only did the conversation take longer, but then when you're done with the conversation, you didn't really retain the things that you need to retain. You didn't really say the things that you needed to say in the best way using right speech. So now you need to follow up with your friend and say, you know, what was that that I was supposed to do? I'm sorry, I, I really zoned out on our conversation, right? So you actually need to go back and you need to clean this up because it wasn't handled properly the very first time. So if you can just handle things single-threaded one at a time, handle it really well, bring your full wisdom to bear in that situation, then if it takes you five minutes, 10 minutes, what have you, you're done. You move on to the next thing. There's nothing to circle back and clean up. Whereas if you continue to attempt to do you know, two, three, four, five, six things at a time, you're rapidly cycling from thing to thing and you're not necessarily doing any one of those things very well. So it's helpful to just do one thing at a time. Now, if you put something in the microwave, for example, and you turn it on and then you go to wash dishes, right? Or you go to make a sandwich, 
This isn't doing two things at one time. The microwave is taking care of the microwaving. But while you're putting this thing in the microwave, you're putting it in the microwave, you're turning it on, and now you're walking away from it. And now you're just focused on making a sandwich, right? So you can be doing these types of things, but you're still just doing one thing at a time. The machine is doing something, which is heating up your food. Now you're doing something, which is making a sandwich. These are two different things by being done by two different situations. A machine is doing one thing and you're doing one thing. So don't feel like you have to put something in a microwave and then just sit there for 10 minutes while it's cooking, right? You can actually leave from that and now go make your sandwich. And this is practicing singleness of mind. Let me pause here and see what questions you guys have on what I've been sharing so far. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, it looks like Tavka has a question, sir. Thank you, Christy. On YouTube, we have a question from Chromatica Photography. My job at times requires multitasking. Is there a way to deal with this without having it adversely affect me? So depending on what type of job you have, you would like to be able to still do one thing at a time, right? So say there's a customer that I'm talking to and I need to also enter something on the computer, right? So I may be talking to the customer and then now that I'm done talking with the customer, I might be entering something on the computer. You're still just doing one thing at a time rather than trying to enter something on the computer and talk on the phone at the same time. So even in jobs where you might have been told to multitask or you think you are multitasking, what you would like to do is do things single threadedly. Even though in the past people might have pushed you to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing, focus on listening to the customer handle the conversation, discuss whatever it is you need to discuss. And then when there's a pause in the conversation, you enter it in to the computer or whatever it is that you're entering. I'm not quite sure what your occupation is. You're welcome to share that if you like. And what are the things you think that you're multitasking with? But what multitasking really is, is it's rapidly cycling the mind from thing to thing to thing to thing. What you would like to do is slow this down. Right? Because as long as the mind is rapidly cycling, then that's what it's going to do. Even when you're sitting at home and you're just trying to relax, the mind becomes overactive and anxious because now at work for eight hours or 10 hours, or however long you were there, the mind was rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing. So when you get home, it's very hard to relax because the mind has been overactive for all this time at work. It's kind of like a racehorse. Not that I necessarily would suggest anybody have a racehorse, but if you have a racehorse that's used to just always running around the track, running around the track, running around the track, when it comes back to the barn, the, the horse is gonna be hyped up. It's, it's gonna be really difficult for that horse to ever relax in the barn because it's been training all day long to race. It's been racing in all these races. It's very difficult for it to just calm down because it's so amped up, because it's always go, 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 go. So if you treat your mind the same way where at work, if you're just go, 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 go all the time, this is why the mind has a hard time relaxing when you're at home. So at work, you can still be very productive, but you would like to slow things down where you're talking on the phone, for example, understanding the conversation, communicating whatever it is you need to communicate, then you're intentionally entering in any data that you need to enter into the computer. Now you're back to the conversation. And you can do this over the course of your workday, but if you're rapidly cycling, like two seconds on the phone, entering data, two seconds on the phone, entering data, two seconds on the phone, entering data, this is where the mind gets you know, really overactive, and then you'll find that it's difficult for the mind to function where it's nice and calm and steady. So to answer your question, yes, there is adverse effects to multitasking, 
But if you learn how to conduct your day where you're not multitasking, that you're doing just one thing at a time and you're not rapidly cycling, but you're intentionally talking on the phone, you're intentionally working on the computer, then you're not actually rapidly cycling because that's what multitasking truly is. It's just the rapid cycling, tricking the mind to think you're doing more than one task, but you're really not. You're just rapidly cycling the mind. So by slowing the mind down, 30 seconds on the phone, a few seconds entering data. A minute or two on the phone, 30 seconds a minute, three minutes entering data. You can do this back and forth, but you do it with intention and you do it consistently and slowly rather than just the rapid go, 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 go. Yes, thank you, Steve. And then on Facebook, Amina asks, as we work to deepen our concentration and the ability to be singularly focused, what about when we are with others who are not focused? For example, recently I ran into a friend who I had not seen for a couple of months. And while we were together for about 10 to 15 minutes chatting on the street, she read messages, talked to everyone who passed and made a call. At the end, she asked me to join her on a walk. But I declined because it was dizzying just standing with her for a few moments. So that did not seem to be the best choice. The question is, as we are each surrounded by people who are multitasking, as the practice goes again, the modern day society, will we wind up spending more time only with those who are also trying to concentrate in their lives? Potentially, it's your decision. So if somebody is choosing to be involved in countless activities while they're around you, you might just choose to no longer associate with that. That's your choice. For some people, they might do that. For some people, they may not. It's really up to you. It depends on the relationship. But in that situation where somebody else is utterly distracted and their mind is rapidly cycling, there's really nothing for you to do in that situation other than to maintain your practice. And I'm going to share something here in a moment that helps you understand when people are grabbing at your attention and trying to distract you, how to handle that. I'm going to share that with you. But in terms of other people choosing to multitask, you shouldn't allow that to affect you whatsoever. You should be able to just continue to stay focused. No need to even stand there on the street with somebody while they're constantly on the phone, talking this, doing that, doing this. You know, you could easily just choose to continue on your walk. And if they're going to be on their phone and constantly actively busy with all those other things, that's their choice. But whether you choose to be around somebody like that is your choice. You may choose to cultivate relationships where people aren't doing those things. But again, it's your choice of how you choose to handle that. You'll probably find that it's more comfortable being around people that are concentrated, but whether you choose to do that or not, it's up to you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Maha has a question in Zoom. She asks, how does one increase their generosity? Yeah, so there's ways for you to practice generosity. Remember, what generosity is, is it's the giving and sharing of things strictly more than is absolutely required. And that's your time, effort, energy, and resources. So you can practice generosity as simply as you're walking into a store and you're opening the door for yourself. You can hold the door for somebody else and let somebody else through. That's generosity. If you're standing in line and somebody drops something on the floor, you can pick it up and say, hey, sir, this is yours, or ma'am, this was yours, you dropped it. These are all ways of practicing generosity. Even walking down the street and just smiling, you know, that's more than strictly required. You can smile at people, you can say hello to people. There's all these little things that you can do, but then there's things like going to donate blood, right? You can do things like this. You can help people in your community. You can help in charitable events and charitable opportunities. Our community has various events going on all throughout the world where there's a need for support in terms of communication and things like this. There's different people working on different projects. If you're ever interested in practicing generosity with your time, effort, energy, or resources, you could contact me and ask me if there's any projects that are currently being worked on that you could get involved in. There's all these different opportunities that are available, and each individual person needs to decide for themselves, where is that middle, right? Because if you're practicing generosity in excess, 
then perhaps you don't have the time, effort, energy, and resources for the things that you need to accomplish for your own life. So you need to bring that into the middle. But also if you are indifferent and you never practice generosity, that wouldn't be helpful for the mind either. So you're always looking to navigate this middle way and be in the middle, even with something like generosity. Yes, thank you, sir. It appears that is all the questions that we have at this time. Okay, so let's move to the next part of what I was going to share with you is to just always keep in mind that the mind can only do one thing at a time. It is a complete misunderstanding and part of this ignorance or unknowing of true reality that the Buddha talked about that the mind can actually do more than one thing. It's utterly impossible. And there's actually an uh, exercise or an activity that I can do with students to help them see that it's not possible for them to do more than one thing at a time, at least for the mind. You can rub your head and rub your stomach. The body can do two things. The body can do multiple things at one time, but the mind can only be at one place. So I can have a phone up to my ear. I can have my eyes watching the TV and I can be eating. I can have the body doing all of these three things, but the mind can't be in all three of those places at one time. So that's why the mind will rapidly cycle amongst those three things, appearing as if you're doing three things. The mind falsely believes it has the misperception that it's doing three things, but in reality, it's rapidly cycling between these three things. So this idea of multitasking is really just promoting the rapid cycling of the mind. And now we've gotten to the point where some people think this is a mental disorder and we call it ADHD or ADD. And people think that their brain is defective because they're not able to concentrate. They're not able to hold their attention. They're not able to stay focused in doing one thing at a time. And people have been taught that now your brain is defective. Well, the brain actually isn't defective at all. It's just that the individual, the person, is using the mind in a way that it wasn't intended to be used, rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing. And this mind has now been trained to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing. Just like that racehorse has been trained to race around the track, that's all that racehorse knows how to do is when it comes out of the barn, it just takes off because that's what it's been trained to do is just run, 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 run. But if you train your mind to run, 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 run all the time, then that's what it's gonna do. You're gonna have a very difficult time calming it down and having focus and have concentration. So always remember that the mind can only do one thing at a time and ensure that you're not overstimulating the mind with this craving desire attachment, which is only gonna promote a muddled mind. As long as you allow the mind to run and lurch forward and go, 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 then it's going to be overstimulated. It's going to have this craving desire attachment. The mind's going to lack concentration. It's going to be muddled. So practicing singleness of mind is what you would like to do is don't attempt to force the mind to do multiple things at one time because it's impossible for it to actually do more than one thing at a time. Practice singleness of mind where you're only doing one thing at a time. If you're eating, you're eating. If you're walking, you're walking. If you're watching TV, you're watching TV. If you're talking on the phone, you're talking on the phone. Just do that one thing, do it really well. If you have studied the Eightfold Path and you've learned things like right speech, for example, where you're practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech, when you're just focused on one thing at a time, having a conversation, then you can be very focused and concentrated and bring forth the full wisdom of something like the five factors of well-spoken speech. And you can do that very, very well in a conversation because you're concentrated and you're only doing one thing at a time. But if your mind is rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, you're not going to be able to bring forth your full wisdom of something like right speech in the five factors of well-spoken speech. So that means you're going to be rapidly cycling the mind. You're going to be using unwise speech. And now you're going to damage your relationships. And then you need to clean this up. And in some cases, you might have had in the past where your mind was doing those things, where your mind was rapidly cycling and you weren't speaking in the best way. And you might have damaged that relationship 
relationship so severely that now you guys can't even be friends anymore or you can't associate with this person any longer because the relationship has been that damaged. That's in the past. You know, you can move on from that, but just use that as an example for yourself to see why this rapid cycling of the mind, which inhibits us from bringing forth our full wisdom to be able to use something like right speech, and then that's going to damage relationships. But then you can see the other side of this, that by slowing the mind down, focusing on just one thing at a time, bringing forth your full wisdom in a conversation, that's going to promote harmony in your relationships. Now your personal and professional relationships can really blossom because when you're talking with a person, you're very intentional about your speech and you're speaking in a way that's very wholesome and you're not harming anybody through your speech because you're bringing forth your full wisdom to be able to share whatever it is you need to share and communicate in that situation. And when you get used to doing that in one conversation and then you do that in a second conversation and a third and a fourth and a fifth, the mind gets used to doing this more and more and more and it will appreciate having been trained to this level of detail that your mind won't ever go back to the way that things were before. Where if now your mind is used to rapidly cycling and you don't bring forth all your wisdom in conversations, that's a well-beaten path that your mind keeps going down. But now it's gonna be a challenge, you know? It's gonna be somewhat difficult to train it to just do one thing at a time and bring forth your full wisdom in that situation. It's like forging this new path. But once you get this new path forged, that becomes easier and easier. And the mind will never go down this other path because you will have seen the improvements to the condition of the mind and the condition of your relationships, that your personal and professional relationships are blossoming more and more. And you're finding that you're more at ease, you're more peaceful, you're more joyful in your conversations. You feel this more inner fulfillment that's occurring based on the conversations and relationships you're having. And that's where you'll see the truth for yourself that this is absolutely working for you and your mind will ever be interested in going back down that path where it was rapidly cycling. In fact, as you get closer and closer to enlightenment, it's impossible for the mind to ever do that again. You'll just slow things down. So in that example that Amina was talking about, if your mind's being trained and you're focusing and just doing one thing at a time, practicing singleness of mind, and you have a lot of people around you that are going in all these different directions, you'll find a way to just slow things down for yourself. And if that means ultimately that you just need to walk away and be like, hey guys, I'll catch up with you later, I'll see you another day, that's what you'll end up doing. Rather than being stuck in a situation where the balls are bouncing all over the room and you're just like, whoa, what are all these balls? You know, you're not going to do that. You're going to just stay focused and clear and concentrated in any given situation. And your mind's not going to rapidly cycle because your mind's been too well trained that it's impossible for it to rapidly cycle from thing to thing to thing. An untrained mind is going to have this longing and yearning. It's going to rapidly cycle. That's part of what's going to occur if you've experienced training your mind to rapidly cycle, it's going to continue to do that until you train it otherwise. So when you observe that the mind is rapidly cycling or it's not concentrated, maybe it's just as simple as you're on a phone call and now your mind is thinking about what you're going to eat for dinner tonight. Where you see even that little bit of difference in the mind where it's not in the present moment handling whatever it's handling with singleness of mind, cut that off and let it go. Whatever you're going to eat tonight for dinner, you'll figure that out at another time. But right now, you're talking on the phone to a friend or you're in a conversation with your neighbor, for example. No need to be thinking about the future, even if that future is 10 minutes from now or 20 minutes from now. Handle that conversation. And then when that's done, that's the time to think about the next thing. So wherever you see that the mind is not in the present moment, thinking or talking or actively involved in what it is that you're doing in the present moment, cut that off and let it go. Being in the present moment is handling what it is that you're handling right now in the present moment. You can be in the present moment and plan for the future. So for example, we have these retreats coming up in 2023. We can talk now in the present moment 
about something we're going to do in the future. But then we're not stuck to that plan. As impermanence happens, we can ebb and flow with that and we can adjust the plan. But we're in the present moment talking about right now, whatever it is that we're talking about. So what being in the present moment means is handling what it is that you're handling right now in this moment. So if you're talking to a neighbor, you talk to a neighbor. But if you're talking to a neighbor and your mind's thinking about washing your car in about 30 minutes, that's doing two things. The mind can't do those two things so that while you're thinking about washing the car, you're ignoring the neighbor. And now your mind is over here thinking about the car. So what you would like to do is cut that off, that thought about washing the car, cut that off and now focus on the conversation with the neighbor. Once that conversation's over, then address the car if that's what you're going to do. So you would like to just do this one thing at a time and get really good at doing that. And then the mind won't actually rapidly cycle because it's been so well trained to just do one thing at a time. So this mindfulness or observing the mind is your way to protect the mind. The Buddha talks about mindfulness or awareness of mind as being the guard for your mind. This is what's protecting your mind. Whereas if you're not aware of what's going on in the mind and you're just talking and talking and then you're having a thought about washing your car, you're having a thought about eating dinner and you're just allowing all of that bombardment of thoughts to occur, you're not watching over the mind with mindfulness. You're not guarding the mind. So you need to guard the mind with this mindfulness or this awareness of mind. You need to watch over the mind with mindfulness. And wherever you see that it's trying to come out of the conversation and it's thinking about washing the car or it's thinking about dinner, that's where you cut that off and let it go and come back to the conversation. And then as you do this more and more, the mind will stay in the middle. And this is where I talk about training the mind to be in the middle. It's like taking a piece of wood. And if you had a piece of steel and you grinded that piece of steel back and forth on the wood, as you first start grinding the steel on the wood, the metal's going to pop out because there's not a real groove in the wood yet. It's going to easily pop out. So when you're talking to your neighbor, as you're beginning to train your mind, it might be easy for the mind to pop out and think about washing your car or think about dinner. But as you grind this steel back and forth on the wood long enough, eventually you get deeper and deeper, creating this deeper and deeper groove where now the steel won't pop out of the wood. So as you get more and more used to practicing singleness of mind and using mindfulness to observe the mind, and as soon as the mind pops out, and it's not in the present moment anymore, and you cut that off and you bring it back, as you do this more and more for an extended period of time over weeks and months and years, eventually the mind gets to the point where it never goes somewhere else. It just stays utterly focused and concentrated. That's how you develop concentration. Then in terms of your interactions with other people, be sure that you're only ever doing one thing at a time with each individual person. So if I'm here talking to a student on Zoom, for example, and having a personal discussion, and my son was to walk into the room, I'm not gonna try to have the discussion with the student and talk to my son at the same time. If he comes in and he tries to grab my attention, he's like, daddy, 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 I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm just gonna to continue to focus on the student. And then over a long-term period of time, my son starts to learn that dad only does one thing at a time. So he's not gonna to try to grab my attention forcefully like that. In the past, he did used to do that. He used to kind of come into my room and try to grab my attention as I'm doing something else. And I would just hold up a finger and I would kind of pause him and I would say, just one moment. And then I would continue to talk to the student. And then when we get to a, a point of pausing, I would ask the student if it'd be okay if I talked to my son, and then I would talk to my son. And then as you do this with people around you, whether it's your children, your life partners, your coworkers, your boss, your neighbors, or what have you, people get used to you only handling one thing at a time, and you'll find that you'll have less distractions because people are learning through the way that you interact in the world that they can't just pull your attention from one thing to the other. 
But if while I was talking to a student, if my son barged in and I was like, yes, son, and right away my attention went to him, what he's going to get used to understanding is that I can go in there and I can interrupt dad. Or if dad's on the phone, I can interrupt dad in a conversation because he's going to give me his attention. So you're teaching people around you at all times the way that you interact in the world. And if you choose to allow people to pull your attention away from whatever task that you're doing or whatever activity that you're doing, they're going to get used to doing that and they're going to do that more. So what you're interested in doing is having singleness of mind where with the singleness of mind, as people are coming to distract you or pull your attention away, you might need to pause them or hold up a finger and just say one moment and then handle whatever it is that you're handling. And then when they're standing there and they're practicing patience, that's a really good thing for them. Whether it's your children, your life partner, your coworkers or what have you, people need to learn that they can't just come into your life and rip you away from whatever activity or task that you're involved in. Because if you allow that to continue, then it will continue. So by you making the choice to pause people like that and handle things one at a time with singleness of mind, then the people around you will tend to function more and more in that way. You will find that they won't pull you away into trying to get your attention and distracting you to do one thing or another. What you're looking to cultivate in order to get to this concentration is this well-trained mind where the mind is relaxed and calm, yet attentive and alert. Sometimes if somebody thinks that the mind is relaxed and calm, they might think lazy and lethargic, but that's not what the enlightened mind is experiencing. A lethargic and lazy mind is not what an enlightened being is. They're relaxed and calm, but they're attentive and alert. When you're relaxed and calm, you'll be able to talk and discuss and have better conversations because in that situation, the mind can be attentive and alert. But if you were attentive and alert and really uptight, it's really challenging for the mind to be able to take in any particular content. So you'd like to combine this where there's the relaxed and calm mind, but yet it's attentive and alert. This is the enlightened mind. You're not interested in just being relaxed and calm or lethargic or dull, and you're not interested in just being attentive and alert or uptight. You're interested in combining these things where the mind comes into the middle, where it can be relaxed and calm, but yet attentive and alert. And this is what will produce more and more focus, concentration, deep memory, and clarity of thought or clarity of mind. Because with the mind being uptight with craving, desire, attachment, you're not going to have a concentrated mind. Or if the mind is dull and lethargic, it's not going to be concentrated there either. So it's only when the mind is relaxed and calm that it can be then attentive and alert. And a calm mind is very important because when there's calmness, you can actually get to wisdom. But if the mind is uncalm, you can't get to wisdom. Because when the mind is shaken up and it's uncalm, then you lack mindfulness or awareness of mind and you lack concentration or being able to focus and have clarity. So therefore, you can't access the wisdom in the mind. You're going to make unwise decisions and there you're going to produce unwise decisions, which leads to unwholesome results. But when your mind is calm and relaxed, yet attentive and alert, now you have this mindfulness and awareness of mind. You have this concentration or this focus, this clarity. And now you can access your wisdom and make wise decisions in this situation that leads to wholesome outcomes. If you've ever been in a situation where you've gotten a certain amount of bad news, perhaps, or a certain difficult situation, and your mind became uncalm and it was shaken up, then you might have made some unwise decisions that made the situation worse. This is because the mind was uncalm. You didn't have mindfulness. You didn't have concentration. Therefore, you couldn't access your wisdom. And whatever decisions you started making, it made the situation actually worse. But when you can remain calm, which is essentially equanimity, this is calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations. Even in difficult situations, if you can remain calm, 
then you can have this awareness of the mind and you can have this focus, this concentration, this clarity. And now you can bring forth your wisdom and make wise decisions in that situation that produce wholesome outcomes. Because if you understand the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, the results of your decisions, that when you make wise decisions, you're going to experience wholesome outcomes. But when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome outcomes. Then if you understand this, you should not ever be interested in making an unwise decision, even though in some situations you may make an unwise decision because the mind is not enlightened, but you'll learn from those mistakes. But eventually you can cultivate so much wisdom in the mind and so much calmness that you can access that wisdom that you'll only be making wise decisions so you'll experience wholesome results. As long as you continue to allow the mind to be shaken up and uncalm, it's going to continue to make unwise decisions and therefore you're going to experience unwholesome results. So coming to this level of calmness and composure, especially in difficult situations, you can now access this wisdom, make wise decisions, and experience more and more improved outcomes in your life. Not being interested in making any unwise decisions at all. Even to the point where if there's a certain situation happening, you might even decide to press pause on that situation. No decision is better than an unwise decision that's going to produce an unwholesome result. So no decision is better than an unwise decision that's going to produce an unwholesome result. So in a situation where you have calmness and composure and you can make wise decisions, then make wise decisions. It's going to produce a wholesome result. But where you observe that the mind is uncalm, where maybe the mind is angered, sad, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, feeling guilty or shameful or fearful, things like this, where the mind is discontent, where there's jealousy and resentment that's arisen in the mind, rather than make decisions through that anger, through that sadness, through those other discontent feelings like frustration and irritation, rather than allow the mind to make decisions in that situation, which means the decision is going to be polluted, it's much better to press pause on that. No decision is better than an unwise decision. Because if you can get to the point where you're only making wise decisions in your life, then you're going to put more and more and more wise decisions into your life. And now you're going to be experiencing more and more and more wholesome outcomes. The way that I think about this is like a garden hose. If you have a garden hose and you keep putting mud into the garden hose, well, when you turn on the water, you're going to get mud out the other end of the garden hose. You're not going to get pure water. But you have put, as part of our past, individuals have put mud into their garden hose. We've made unwise decisions. What you're doing in the Buddhist teachings is you're now turning on the water and you're flushing out all of those unwise decisions through cultivating wisdom. You're getting out all of that mud out of the garden hose. And eventually, if you put enough clean water into this garden hose, you're going to get nothing but clean water out the other side. But it's going to take time for all that mud to wash out of the garden hose. So as you observe that the mind is uncalm, don't allow it to keep making decisions. Put a pause on that. Then when you get to a level of calmness, a few hours, a few days, or a few weeks later, whatever it is, then start making those decisions that are going to be impactful to your life. And that's where you can then get to all wise decisions that produce wholesome outcomes. Continue to develop the mind and use the mind on a regular basis. Because as you're training the mind in meditation and you're training your mind in daily life as part of the Eightfold Path and some of the things that I'm describing to you here today, there's a tendency for the mind to become complacent. That you can get to a point where you've eliminated enough craving, desire, attachment in the mind where things are fairly peaceful. Things are fairly relaxed. You might experience complete peacefulness for three months or six months. The mind's not quite enlightened yet. So maybe once every three months or once every six months, you feel a little bit of discontentedness here and there. But it's not enough for you to really pay attention to it. The mind can actually be worked into this complacency where it's no longer practicing as closely as it once did. 
And as this complacency sets in, not only can it set in in terms of discontentedness and not taking action to eliminate that discontentedness, it can also happen with concentration too. You can experience a certain level of focus and concentration that is far beyond what you ever experienced in the past before you were on the path to enlightenment. And now you don't really take the action and the effort to cultivate even more concentration. Well, once the mind is enlightened and there's no more discontentedness in the mind, there's actually continued development that the mind can continue to develop and increase levels of concentration. Even though the mind is enlightened and there's no more pollution in the mind, you're not experiencing any discontentedness. If you continue to exercise the mind, you can experience increased levels of concentration. And some simple things that you might decide to do to kind of exercise the mind, of course, there's meditation and the things that we talk as part of the normal eightfold path, but then there's simple things that you can be doing. Like if you're on the computer and the computer sends you a one-time password to your mobile phone in order to log into a certain website. Well, what you might do is you might end up looking at the phone and then you type in the, the code but this isn't really exercise in the mind. Maybe this six digit code, you could look at it on your phone, memorize it, put the phone down and then type in the code. And this is one little short, little tiny thing that is actually going to help you to then be able to exercise the mind and remember those six digits. It sounds simple and it is, but this is exercising the mind. In the old days, if you would like to call somebody on the phone, you had to remember people's phone numbers. And you know, depending on how good your memory is, that's how many different people you might have talked to at any given time. Well, nowadays we can program this stuff into our phone and we can forget about it, right? The world around us with technology has almost incentivized the lack of concentration in society. And that's okay because these tools make it easier for us to conduct our daily life. But what you would like to do is exercise the mind in situations where it otherwise wouldn't get exercise. So if there's a certain phone number that you can memorize or other things that you can memorize, this is really helpful to exercise the mind. Things like chanting. This is one of the reasons why I teach Buddhist chanting is it helps you to build your memory and exercise the mind. It helps you to build concentration. So there's these little things like this that you can do that you might have kind of looked past and maybe the mind has become complacent in some situations where it's no longer taking the effort to memorize certain things. So try to do that in situations and take advantage of situations where you might otherwise just look at the phone and type in a password look at the password, put the phone down, and then try to type it in. And you know, if you get it wrong, okay, no big deal. Pick up the phone and enter it and try it again, right? So these are the type of things that you can be doing. And there's others that are probably in your life that you can be thinking about of just little simple things like that to exercise the mind. This also helps to develop confidence as well, that you can see the condition of the mind is gradually improving as you develop more and more concentration and memory. So this is everything that I had to share with you guys today on this topic of developing singleness of mind in the distracting world and how to acquire this concentration. I'm gonna turn things over to all of you guys to see what questions you guys might have related to applying this in your life or if you're having certain situations that you would like to talk about and discuss, we can do that with our time that we have in class today. You can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Thank you, sir. Miranda has a question. Yes, thank you, ma'am. On Facebook, Mia asks, why are we prone to multitasking? Is it a way to avoid being still and present and therefore we need to strive past that inclination? In my opinion, I feel that in society that we've been taught that multitasking is beneficial, that we're more productive. Uh, that it's a desirable quality in the work field, in the workplace. And this is just because of the unknowing of true reality. This is the ignorance. If you guys remember back to the analogy that I talk about with the lotus flower and that how the lotus flower has got its roots deep down into the mud 
and then there's this murky water and the stalk needs to grow up through this murky water and then as it gets up over the dirty murky water it blooms like a lotus flower well that's what the enlightened mind is doing is it's coming through that murky water and it's got to rise above that murky water in order to get above it and bloom so you can see this beautiful bloom if the lotus flower is down in the mud you can't see the beautiful bloom because it's still stuck in the mud and it's stuck in that dirty water. That dirty water is representative of the world, that the world has all this unknowing of true reality. The world has so many things that the mind is trying to be pulled towards, whether it's uh, stealing or sexual misconduct or lying or taking substances that cause heedlessness all kinds of unwholesomeness, all kinds of lack of wisdom, all kinds of cultural traditions and things that we've been taught are actually helpful for our life. But because we've only believed these things, we didn't know the truth, we might have decided that we're going to do these things because if the vast majority of the world is talking about multitasking and this is a desirable quality, then people might kind of conform to what's going on in the world around us where we're stuck in this dirty water. An enlightened being isn't going to conform to what's going on around the world because the vast majority of the world is unknowing of true reality and that's that dirty water. In order to bloom like a lotus flower, you've got to rise above the dirty water and see that, yeah, this multitasking, it's unknowing of true reality, this rapid cycling of the mind actually doesn't help us, it's actually harming us. And when you can see that for what it is, which is the unknowing of true reality in that dirty water, then you can choose and make the conscious choice that I'm not going to do this anymore. Even though the vast majority of the world is thinking this way and talking this way, I'm going to choose not to do this and I'm going to get above the murky water. And you do this with something like multitasking, but you also do it with other aspects of this practice, whether it's drinking and taking substances that cause heedlessness, whether it's sexual misconduct, whether it's all these other things, maybe the vast majority of the world are stealing or getting in fights and arguing. Maybe the majority of the world is being hostile and bitter and aggressive, but you're choosing as an individual not to do those things. So multitasking is just one more aspect of the world that is this unknowing of true reality. It's part of that dirty, murky water. And as an enlightened being, to be able to get to enlightenment, you're that lotus flower that's trying to rise above the murky water. And that's the only way you can bloom and experience the, the brightness of the bloom is by getting above that murky water. And the multitasking is just one of those things that a lot of people in the world are just having a false belief and a misperception that it's actually beneficial and helpful because they just haven't looked at what it's truly doing to the mind and how it's degrading the quality of the mind. Thank you, sir. Tonka has a question. Thank you. On YouTube, we have a question from Brandon. Would driving and listening to something be considered multitasking? This is doing two things at one time. Oftentimes, as we are on this path, we need to create more and more space in our life. You know, we're used to driving and listening to music, driving and listening to a podcast, for an example. And as we're growing on this path, we might find that, okay, you know, this is kind of like where I am in my life right now, that I would like to listen to these teachings of the Buddha, listen to the podcast and drive at the same time. And this is the way that I can actually learn these teachings. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't actually have an opportunity to learn these teachings because maybe I've got a lot of children or maybe I've got a lot of demands at work. And, you know, this is the only time that I really have to listen to an audiobook or listen to a podcast. So you might choose to actually do these things for a period of time. And that's your way of learning the teachings and getting your practice up and running to a certain point. But then as you are stripping away more and more of the craving, desire, attachments, and you're looking to develop more and more concentration, and you've situated your life such that you can listen to a podcast in another situation where you're not driving, or you can listen to music outside of 
a situation where you're driving, then you would like to do it that way. But the mind's going to want to drive and listen to a podcast or it's going to want to listen to music. And this might be what you just need to do for a period of time enough to get the teachings into the mind and practice to a certain degree where you've created enough space in your life. And then when you're looking to bring your practice up to higher and higher degrees and experience more and more concentration, you might decide, okay, I'm going to start driving and only driving and that's it. I'm not going to listen to music or I'm not going to listen to a podcast. And you don't necessarily need to kind of force the mind to do that, but you'll feel when it's the right time. You know, I used to always listen to music when I was driving. You know, I used to have, as I was younger, some of those big loud speakers and the bass and it would vibrate my car. It was so loud. But now at this point in the training that I've done, I'm not interested in listening to music. I enjoy music. I'll listen to it occasionally at home, but I just listen to the music by myself. It's just the music but I don't drive and listen to music. And that's where you start appreciating the concentration that you've developed and you see all the benefits in all these different parts of your life. And you look for more and more ways to strip out where the mind is attempting to do more than one thing at a time. And this is a common one because what the mind's actually doing in that situation in some cases is if we're driving, the mind might be bored. And then in order to cover that boredom, we'll turn on music. And we think that that solves the problem. But the thing that's producing the boredom is the craving desire attachment. So if we turn on the music every time we drive to cover up the boredom, then we don't actually address the craving desire attachment that's producing the boredom. So you need to kind of experience the boredom, observe that the mind's craving music, eliminate that craving to music, And now as you are driving and you've eliminated the craving to the music, now the mind won't be bored anymore. There won't be any boredom because the craving has been eliminated. But as long as the craving's there and we turn on the music in order to cover up the boredom, then you'll never actually eliminate the craving. Thus, you won't eliminate the boredom, not just in driving, but outside of driving as well. So a mind will need to go through periods of boredom in order to eliminate boredom. This is why I call it walking through the fire until you get to the other side. And then when you get to the other side, you appreciate the fresh air. So you kind of have to walk through the boredom, experience the boredom, train the mind to be peaceful and joyful while you're driving and that there's no boredom in the mind. And then you can actually experience the liberation because the mind will no longer experience boredom. But if we continue to listen to music all the time, then the mind will continue to experience boredom because it still has that craving for stimulation. So wherever you get to the right point in your practice where you feel like you're ready to let go of something like that, then you do that and you train the mind to do that. And you might experience that there's boredom in the mind for a period of time, maybe weeks or a few months, but then you kind of get to the other side of that And you realize, wow, this is so wonderful. I can drive, I can sit, I can go anywhere. And the mind's no longer bored whatsoever because you've eliminated the craving that is producing the boredom, for example. Thank you, teacher David. Mm -hmm. And also, I have a question about jhanas. Like, I'm wondering if uh, experiencing first jhana can be so gradual that we can hardly notice it, or is it so drastic that we would know 100% that that's what's going on? I can speak from my experience that when somebody experiences the jhanas, it's very clear that that's what's happening. It doesn't necessarily happen like a light switch but for some people it can be like a light switch where there's a sudden shift and you experience this unique qualities of the mind that is very different than when you were on the path and not in the jhanas and it's definitely very different than when you were off the path because there's a certain level of qualities of mind that you experience in the jhanas that isn't experienced at any other time in your life and it's like whoa there it is and you can observe the qualities of the mind this is what i observed i'm not sure that everybody experiences that same thing because with impermanence of course different people's experience are going to be different 
but you should notice those qualities that the Buddha talks about in the jhanas. You should notice those qualities as the mind moves into those jhanas. You should see certain qualities arising and you should see certain things diminishing that he talks about in those jhanas. And you should be able to track and observe for yourself that, yep, I'm experiencing that, I'm experiencing that, yep, I'm experiencing that. Oh yes, the mind no longer does that, then the mind no longer does that. So as you read the description of the jhanas, see if that's describing what it is that you're experiencing. And if it is, then I'd be interested to know because I haven't talked with anybody about what their experience is with the jhanas. I only know from my experience. And for me, there was sudden shifts. You know, that is what I experienced with the first jhana. And then moving through the second, third, and fourth, it wasn't a delineation. I had to really look really closely to observe whether the mind was in the first, second, third, or fourth jhana. So it's not like a dial on a stove, for example, where it's like low, medium, high, and you know exactly if you're low, medium, high. With the jhanas, once I got into the first jhana, I noticed that very clearly. But then moving to the second, third, and fourth, it wasn't as apparent. I had to actually look and read and kind of observe how the mind was functioning based on what the Buddha was explaining. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It appears that is all the questions we have at this time, Teacher for David. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So I will just thank all of you guys for attending today's class and encourage you to continue to practice to cultivate concentration in the mind. An enlightened being is going to have a high degree of focus, concentration, clarity of mind, and deep memory. Some of the other things that you can be doing in order to focus and develop your concentration, as I mentioned, you would like to exercise the mind is as you're learning these teachings, remembering them in the order that they're discussed in terms of like the five factors of well-spoken speech. If you're learning these teachings in order to practice them, the Buddha put these things in lists and he ordered them in the way that he did for a reason. So it's something like the five factors of well-spoken speech, understanding that it's being spoken at the right time. What you say is true, speaking gently, speaking beneficially and with a mind of loving kindness. When you're learning the five precepts, for example, learning about killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and substances that cause heedlessness, knowing those in order, the five aggregates, the eightfold path, all of these things, you're exercising the mind to be able to remember them and then apply them in your life. So these are some other ways that you can cultivate your concentration. As you go forward, remember you're going to need to build up your meditation practice to two to three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And people start at different places with that. You know, some people start for five minutes just once a day or twice a day for 10 or 15 minutes. Wherever you start is where you start. But what you would like to do is over a number of months and maybe even years, you build up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more per session. That's what you would ultimately like to get to. And this is going to help you to develop your practice along with all the other factors on the Eightfold Path. We're going to be restarting the group learning program at the beginning of January, and I'm going to be going through in detail the Eightfold Path in detail. But for the rest of this year, I'm going to be teaching these specialized classes to help you guys understand this harmony in relationships and how to actually cultivate the mind to develop this harmony. Our next Sunday class is titled Developing and Maintaining Relationships, Choosing Wholesome Friends and a Life Partner. Because the Buddha prioritized in your life practice and what he taught as part of his teachings to cultivate wholesome friends in your relationships. Because if you had a lot of people who were into unwholesome things, this is going to tend to influence your mind. And if people are into unwholesome things, that's their choice. We're not judging them. We're not looking down on them. We're not thinking that they're a bad person. But if you choose to be around people that are into unwholesome things, it's going to tend to influence your mind in a negative way. So, for example, if I grew up as a child with a lot of people who were into unwholesome things, maybe selling drugs or things like this, and now later in my life, I'm just holding on to those relationships 
But now if we're driving down the road and this friend of mine from a child who sells drugs and I know they sell drugs, we get pulled over by the police and they happen to put some cocaine under my chair of the car, I'm going to jail. And that's because of my decision to have a relationship with someone who's into unwholesome things. Now, I don't need to judge that person. I don't need to look down on them to choose that I would prefer to not be in a relationship with this person. And that would be unwise for me. So there's certain things that you'll need to learn in terms of how to make wise decisions about wholesome friends and a life partner where you can make wise decisions without judging people and just choosing to cultivate relationships around you that are wholesome. Because as you cultivate relationships that are wholesome, this is going to help influence your mind in a positive way. And this is going to help propel you towards enlightenment. And that's one of the reasons why oftentimes people in a community like this tend to get to know each other and tend to be friends with each other because you're interested in cultivating relationships with people who are into wholesome things. So going to retreats and meditation groups and meeting people along the path who are on the path, you'll find that you'll have a lot more success because these are individuals who are interested in inner improvement and in inner development. And when you're cultivating relationships with people like this, you'll find that it will help to influence you in positive ways and kind of propel you towards enlightenment because you're around a lot of people who are thinking about inner development and inner growth. So I'm going to provide you some guidance on how to choose friends and life partners that are into wholesome things without actually judging these people and without looking down on them. That's what we're going to be doing next Sunday. And then this Wednesday in our class, I'll be doing loving kindness meditation with you guys. I'll guide you guys in a session. You guys can come together to encourage, support, and motivate each other in your meditation practice. And this is a really nice way to come together as a community and then work on your meditation practice. And then I'll also open up to any questions that you guys might have. So Wednesdays are really nice for that as well. So I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's class and invite you to attend future classes as well. I'll see you guys perhaps in one of these future classes. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.